has been a weekend of upsets across North America and Europe. But if there is one thing that is a constant, Jay Hao, it's that Dignitas is the team to beat right now in Europe. If you pick up Wubby in the offseason, I'd say that's a pretty good start to, to their path. And then, of course, Zelia and the roster changes there. I'd say they're looking pretty good so far. Yeah, 3-0 win over Method. I don't think they've dropped a single game yet, which looks pretty good for them on their way to the Western Clash. But we are talking about North America now and that looking at how the standings for NA are starting to shape up. I think it's safe to say that today is the day that we find out who is the team to be in North America with Team Freedom and Tempo Storm getting wins on Friday. They are both at two and zero, and only one of them will be able to go three and zero as they face each other today. But the story of yesterday, Jay How, was Heroes Hearth and LFM both putting wins on the board. Yeah, a big step for both of those teams coming in, two fresh new teams into the league. We know LFM a little less experienced than some of the names on Heroes Hearth, but they've been stepping up and this is their third series. They've come in and they've showed market progress so far and getting that I think is a big step for their future and potentially more wins to come. Yeah, and Space Station and Gale Force, we know that the top four teams within the region are the ones who get to go to the Western Clash. And while we've heard a lot about, you know, Tempo, Team 12, Team Freedom, those aren't for certain. And we don't, we definitely don't know that fourth team for certain. So both of them trying really hard to make sure that they're in the ones in the spot. And those, those losses don't help for sure. They don't, but I think as this week kind of established a baseline for how we're going to go. The upsets, of course, earlier this weekend, maybe some more today. We'll see. But as kind of the upsets have gone, getting into that middle spot, but putting yourself near the top like one of our teams will do today definitely sets it up a little bit easier. But I think there's definitely going to be a lot of scrapping going on for that third, fourth spot. Oh, so. yeah. And uh, that starts a little bit today, too. Let's check in with the schedule as, although it is sad that it is our HGC Sunday, we have to wait a whole nother week for more games. It's been quite a Sunday already. I talked about Upset City, and maybe the biggest in Europe is that Zealots got a win over Fnatic. That is huge. And meanwhile, Team Dignitas continuing their rampage through Europe. Later on, that Team Freedom Tempo Storm match of the weekend, but first, Simplicity versus Team 12. Team 12 coming off of a tough loss versus Tempo Storm. No doubt Simplicity eyeing them hungrily right now. The team 12 could easily be that undefeated team that we saw in the standings, and Tempo Storm could have had that. It went to an epic five-game series that we had here to start our weekend off right on Friday. Team 12 came up a little bit short, but they still feel like they're going to be one of the teams to beat. Simplicity, the verdict's still out. They dropped their series to Gale Force, which had a little bit of, I, I guess, experimental process, it seemed like Simplicity, but that second set that they had last weekend definitely put them a little bit higher in my mind in terms of how they'll uh, eventually kind of shape out. But against Team 12, if you get that win, if you're Simplicity, it looks really good. If you're Team 12, that's kind of where people are thinking you're going to go. But to me, I think this is a much closer matchup than on paper. Yeah, it's tough to tell how this series will go, but I am excited to get it started. As always, we talk to the players before the match. Let's hear from Goku and King Caffeine about the series. I feel like with Old Gods that um, it's very interesting to see that a, a bunch of those players become one team because it's true, they are old gods. I think right now is they need to try to break that mold that, that they've been, I guess, suffering over this a long period of time. And if they can do that, they can be a very devastating team. I think there is a possibility of where they can break that threshold. It's just whether they have a leader to do that with, whether they have the person, the right person in charge. Because it's very hard if, like, to be in charge when all the other players have that same mentality because they've been leaders before. I think the way Old Gods performs is going to be pretty much entirely up to them. I know that they have had good success in the past individually, and they do have a lot of talent on that team. It's just whether they put that talent to work. So I think it's if, if they work hard and they want it bad enough, I think they can do pretty well. But if not, we'll just get a repeat of the Old Gods. Roll20 right now is a really scary team. I'd say they're the scariest team in North America. Uh, it's a team of five really solid players who really spend a lot of time at the game and spend a lot of extra time you know, going through strategies. And they also have that X factor that you don't really see in a lot of teams. And that's the synergy, you know, like the team bonding. Um, it's something that is what you need to be one of the top teams in the world. It's not just the hard work and the play. You know, It's how your team communicates together inside and outside of the game. And I think they have that. So I'm really looking forward to what they do this year. 
Roll20, I feel like, just got upgraded. They got Kieran Dansky, two phenomenal players, and behind Justin, Buds, and Goku, it's gonna be, a, I think, the best team. I think my favorite player to watch is Goku, because I really enjoyed watching his progression as a player over the past year and a half. Um, there's, there's not a lot of playmakers in HOTS, I'd say. You know, there's a lot of players who are very consistent, uh, really good at just sustaining a good level of play. Um, but then there's certain players that, you know, they're able to force openings instead of just capitalizing on mistakes. And Goku's one of those players, so I find him really fun to watch. Praise from a world champion like King Caffeine is always good to get, and it's absolutely true. Goku is fantastic on his role. He's at the top of his role in North America. He is well on his way to being counted among the top in the entire world. Airho Airho's got his work cut out for him, for sure, in that role. He does, and Goku, I, it's nice to see the praise from the players. We've been liking him. Going into BlizzCon last year, the spotlight that we had on him on the, one of the player stories was fantastic. Speaking to him behind the scenes when we got to interview him was also very revealing in the way that he approaches the game, his mindset, how dedicated he is. So it, it's hard not to root for this guy and the progress that we've seen from him. He's kind of starting to become that package deal. I always gonna am gonna equate him to Wubby for a while now, and I think as he continues to move it up, that's he's definitely a player to watch for sure. Oh yeah, there's so many players to watch in this series. Really, just every single player on Team 12. But there are some players to watch for simplicity, and we want to go more into that. But let's get started with the battleground pool first. We are going to Dragonshire for game one. The bands, Simplicity have banned Braxis Holdout. And then the ban is Cursed Hollow for Team 12. Team 12 also banned Cursed Hollow versus Tempo Storm. And it has been more of a favored pick for Simplicity. So that carries through to this weekend. Simplicity picks, picks Dragonshire. Jay Howe, when we were looking at the stats for Simplicity, they're very hit or miss for those three aggressive players that we that we know love to play aggressively, right? King Caffeine, uh, you've got Zuna as well, and then Air Ho. It all is very dependent on the heroes they play. It's very dependent, and we've seen the hit or miss, maybe the hot or cold, because the, the Jaina pick has been a, a very, I, I don't know, surprise pick, but all of a sudden it became like the norm, the meta. But some of the things that we've seen from Zuna quite haven't added up. He likes to make the big plays. He likes to get in and get into an aggressive position. And sometimes with Jaina, before you finish that baseline quest, can be a little bit problematic. Gilly, he's died more than a handful of times on that hero. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, he has the most deaths on the team per game, but it's very dependent on which heroes he's playing. It's a lot more for Jaina and a lot less kills overall, whereas it goes down on deaths, but up in kills for Greymane. And then once you get to his Tychus and Lee being very low in kills, average kills per game, or low, deaths per game, but high in kills per game. And then for King Caffeine, it's sort of the same. His ETC, very low deaths. Muradin, a lot more deaths, but played about the same. And his ETC has a winning record, 4-0, or a 0-3 for Muradin. And even Airho with his Dahaka, less than one death per game. We saw him make a lot of great plays with drag, but having a lot more struggles with the Leoric. But in general, that's kind of been the theme for a lot of the solo players in North America with that Leoric. Yeah, Dahaka and Arthas, depending on Arthas's role, Dahaka is basically the only one with that plus 50% win percentage sitting just at above 50%. Yeah. So it has been something, I think Leoric in North America yes. sitting somewhere around 30, 33. 35, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the lower tier, and this is a map that will heavily favor that solo. Malthael, of course, has a pretty wide, he has good success so far. He's been banned out a lot though. He has. And it's normally in that second ban spot. So if Simplicity is gonna go down that route for Urho, you have to consider the Dahaka pickup maybe early here, else you might get the Leoric post second ban if Malthael does get banned out. Yeah, and for Simplicity, I feel like Dahaka is even more important because they fell behind quite a lot of Guild Force Esports and the Dahaka was sort of a crucial role in them being able to keep up with the soak and allow themselves to get into the late game team fights where they did find more success versus scale force versus space station it was sort of a different tale they didn't really have the same problems of falling behind in rotations but space station was bringing the fight to them a lot more in this case we can rely on team 12 trying to get ahead in the early game so we'll see what simplicity can do to try to combat that or if not doing that set themselves up for late game fights the way tempo did 
Well, late game fighting, ETC and Greymane have quite a bit of that, and you spoke to the successes of Simplicity when Zuna is on that Greymane, depending on what the second hero obviously will be. And then ETC for King Caffeine has kind of been the standout. ETC has an incredibly high win rate in North America, sitting around 75% of his games, yeah. just a little bit higher in 21 games played. That is a substantial win rate when you compare it to every other tank outside of Diablo, who I think right now might be six and one, but all other main tanks, unless you, depend on where you put Arthas, are below a 50% win rate right now in North America. Right, and ETC is also the most picked of all of those warriors. So it says a lot that you have the sample size that high and having that high of a win rate to boot. So getting that ETC, Simplicity hasn't lost yet for ETC, so that sets them up very well. They have great rotations back and forth. Maybe you can try to get some picks, some control with that ETC. But Team 12 are gonna move into more of the safety net of having Johanna to add to the wave clear, make sure that they have a strong frontliner who has that unstoppable, and then getting Lucio. Well, the Lucio pickup, obviously, he's basically the most prioritized, the highest involvement rate in supports here in North America. Now, the thing that scares me a little bit is Greymane has early game kill potential. ETC can help set that up. We've seen some good Stukov play from K1 Pro so far, and he's done really well on Dragonshire. Johanna, without the iron skin, is a little bit handicapped there if you can get that silence. So if I'm Team 12, as good as Alex Straza might have looked, this might not be the map, I would highly consider getting a Stukov ban against Simplicity here. But first, Simplicity looking to ban Abather against Team 12. I don't... I don't think that Stukov ban is outside of the realm of possibility, though you haven't really seen that too much, and they may go back to the familiar mouth ale in that role. Simplicity, out of every single team in HGC, Korea, Europe, and North America, prioritizes Stukov the highest. The next is Team Gluck, which happens to be my favorite team, <laughs> for obvious reasons, that's also my last name, but they are the most prioritizing of Stukov, of any team. And here on Dragonshire, we've seen other teams be able to make it work and having that synergy between CAF and K1 Pro, you know it's gonna be there. But they're gonna be a Malfurion instead. The Dhaka's made it through. Now that's the other thing, you get the slide into Roots, which also give you really good lineup in terms of getting that kill potential. Although Roots, you can still iron skin out of that. So the Stukov pick considered here, but the Dahaka made it through. In particular, and the Mouth Ale banned out. Mouth Ale obviously does really well on the solo lane, loses right. out to almost nobody. And so I think that's one of the very telling point. Simplicity, if they go down the Leor Leoric route, I'd be a little bit surprised. Uh, Dahaka seems to fit more of that play style in Dragonshire. The later you get to the game, the more valuable he is. And then, of course, whether they prioritize the support here or not, we'll find out soon. Likely we're waiting on not only K1 Pro's pick and Airho's pick, but Hosty's pick too. Has to see the false dad. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> what I was thinking of. It uh, Hanzo's gone. He's played Hanzo, Abathur, and Jaina. Could also be maybe we're seeing that Jaina later on, but there's the Dahaka. And Junkrat. All right. The Junkrat pick. I mean, you can get the displacement. Sometimes all it takes is one, especially approaching one of those. And, and Junkrat, you know, he can easily flex to a solo lane if Dahaka needs to go and you need to work on rotations. He can go there, but getting those concussion mines and those traps around the, the control, the shrine, I mean, it does make it a little bit scarier when it comes to engage. Johanna's okay there. It's not that big of a deal, but they're going to need more. I yeah, Junkrat's pretty safe, as is right now, unless he gets boot back. Uh, there, there's not a lot of dive to be concerned about for him at the, uh, with the current picks of 12. Maybe a Medivh? Maybe. Coming up from Team 12 to make sure whoever gets targeted, you have protection, but in case they get displaced, you can get them back in. Plus, it, it doesn't... I, I just, I'm not sure if that's enough damage for me when it comes to Team 12. Well, we gonna need a Goku hero. You would think... Leoric, there's also Sonya, he's played a lot of different damn. things, but it'll be Here's Leoric, so and then Tychus is the final pick for Team 12. It's pretty much been the meta that we've seen as of late, just control that front line. You have the interrupt on the mosh pit as well, and can rip through that health bar. Now it's up to Simplicity to round this out, and support is the name of the game. Given that we're running a gray main Junkrat on the side of Simplicity, you know, Kerazim not that appealing. Alex Straza not the great on, greatest on this map. Uther's still there. 
But the way that I've seen Uther against Hanzo has not looked pretty the last few days. Uh, and it's not terrible, but it's much better paired with him and the Tastar that we've seen. I'm pretty sure Goku has been running a lot more in Tomb than March the Black King in the Leora games that we've seen. So whoever it is wants to make sure that he is comfortable with being able to help people with the uh, with the Entombs and making sure that he could be comfortable if he is the Entomb target. I still think it's going to end up being Stukov, just knowing simplicity. Yeah, there it is. They have really good early game kill potential. They have sub uh, a substantial amount of wave clear just between Tahaka and Junkrat to kind of give that possibility of the three-man roaming or just flexing off one of those heroes. Greymane in particular might be able to go top. I think there's a lot that Simplicity can do. We've seen different teams have a very different approach on how they go through, whether it's invading. We've seen Tempo Storm be very aggressive on invading the early Siege Giants. I think the possibility is there. If we see Simplicity go that route, it fits their mentality, their play style. I'd kind of like to see them maybe bring the fight a little bit to Team 12 here early. Well, we have to remember it is Simplicity's battleground choice. And of the five games Team 12 played versus Tempo Storm, this is the main game, the main battleground, where Tempo Storm got ahead early and stayed. They kept that lead. Everywhere else was either Team 12 getting a lead, snowballing that lead to a pretty fast win, like on Towers or Battlefield of Eternity, or Team 12 in Tempo being very close, Team 12 maybe getting the first keep, but then Tempo Storm just not dying, like on Fernal Shrines, when they had the Alexstrasza and the Ragnaros, they just didn't die, and then they were able to get back in the game. So getting a first win, it would feel like Simplicity picking this map, they feel like they have the opportunity to get that first win because it is Dragonshire. What would you like to see Team 12 do in the laning phase if Simplicity bring the fight? It's going to have to be a cautious approach. We saw some teams get split the other day on Dragonshire, most notably Team 12. They kind of pathed right through that triangle position. They didn't have the defensive tools to deal with that. They didn't have the support. They got split, they got punished, and they got behind in that game. And I think with this approach, the fact that you've got ETC Stukov on the other side, I think you're going to have to take a cautious approach, look to grab early camps, maybe the Siege Giant camp, just to relieve that pressure, keep them honest in the rotations on the side of Simplicity, and look to create opportunities through the camps. I think that's going to be a much safer approach for them. So a potential tortoise versus the hare situation yeah. for game one on Dragonshire. Let's get to it. Let's see if Simplicity can get a win versus Team 12, or if Team 12 will bounce back after their loss versus Tempo. Kicking the day off right to see who's going to put themselves up at the top of North America here, as it will be Simplicity on the left in blue here. Hosty will be on Junkrat, Urho on Dahaka, Zuna on Greymane, K1 Pro on Stukov, and King Caffeine on ETC. In the red, the North American Gold Club World Championship representatives at Dainsky will be on Tychus, Cure playing Hanzo. Justin will be playing the Johanna, Goku on his Leoric, and Lucio will be played by Buds. See the skirmish out. Urho making use of his global. Going to miss out on the tongue there. Take a little bit of damage in return, but sometimes you just try and get a little bit sneaky. See if you can maybe get an early kill, a little bit of early damage, but all for not. Arrow looks like he was heading back up. He's going to go in for one more drag. Gets pulled in. That's a pretty early iron skin. He's going to burrow out from that. Not able to catch Dusting after that iron skin. And now Airho and Goku will head up to their top lane for the eternal solo lane battle. That is to take place on Dragonshire. We've got a quick pause. Uh, definitely the key thing to note there. ETC path to the right side coming down through. And Team 12, after getting caught out just uh, by Tempo Storm the other day, they took a very <laughs> long approach. Johanna was actually the one that was hanging out middle, has decent wave clear, can survive there. It's hard to dive and gank on that. Then you look at Junkrat and Tychus, they will have control of the bottom lane clear, and then maybe go back up to clear the camp. But definitely a, a cautious approach by Team 12. Team 12 playing versus LFM Esports the first week played similarly in that they were playing more cautiously. It was kind of dependent on the draft. They had a, something about the same as this with the Johanna again. But they are willing to switch into that cautious mode if they feel like they are the, you know, the stronger team, they have that strength, just want to make sure that they don't make any mistakes, and then punish when their opponents feel like you know, maybe they've got the upper hand and start to get a little risky. 
Well, I love the approach by both teams. Team 12 is getting their camp, as we saw Simplicity pick up the Siege Giants. But more importantly, Hosty went over and put a mine on the bottom right. That way they keep vision, knowing that if they got theirs first, they might go in for that early invade. Getting the vision on that camp is a power play. They're going to give up the top right camp, but this is Simplicity doing the invade. These are the things that they need to do if they want to try and get an early game advantage here against Team 12. And seeing that some of Team 12 were up at that top camp, you're going to push out the, the uh, wave at the same time. Simplicity just barely get those Giants in time before the rest of Team 12 show up in the rotation back down. But Simplicity, you're still going to be able to get some work done in this bottom lane. They've done some tower damage, and they'll take over the Shrine. They've sent Junkrat to the top to help deal with that night camp, and I think it's a really good call. This got some of the best wave clear here, and that's two really good wave clear heroes. Neutralize this, make sure you don't give up too much in the top, and then allow the team to just kind of hold and stabilize in the bottom area. And, you know, with the camps being picked up, Gilly, we still have the night, the night camp at the top left on the side of Simplicity, plus the neutral one bottom. Wouldn't be surprised if we see Simplicity make some early plays for those. Yeah, we saw the same versus, or with uh, LFM, I think it was. Once they started to get pretty comfortable in the rotations, they went for that. But instead, we're seeing Team 12 do that, taking over in the bottom, uh, stabilizing after the push there. And they've got both of the, the uh, temples, which is requiring King Caffeine to keep a hold of the mid until we can take one of those shrines back. <laughs> well, we're looking at the bruisers, but Simplicity going back down. And we may see a little bit of a skirmish break out over these. Yeah, Simplicity instantly rotated down. And Mine's there. Yeah, the mine is there. They're not getting on there. And Team 12 saw that in the rotation. They respected that. And Simplicity, they're making the hard engages, the hard invades. And they have the composition to do that. And Team 12 is respecting it. Yeah, Simplicity not wanting to just allow that to be taken out for free, even giving some poke along with that. And this is getting some good damage done, sending out the mines from afar from the shrine. And then even uh, sending Zuna up. The rotations from Simplicity have been excellent at the start of this. Team 12, though, doing a great job of making sure they have the appropriate responses. But Simplicity doing a lot to that bottom lane could be a, an opening for them later on. It looks like the call, as we saw Taika start to head up top, was that Urho being very aggressive, so you might as well see if you can get a pick. Urho actually ate quite a bit of damage, does have his well tap, so he's going to be fine. But it's Team 12. They, you know, they've lost their, their, their siege camp at the bottom right. They got the invade. They got invaded on the bottom. And so far, Simplicity's kind of controlled the pace of the game, controlled the rotations. And it's been up to, to Simplicity to get a kill, to find something. They haven't gotten much out of it. But Team 12, nonetheless, has not had an answer just yet, other than to just kind of neutralize what Simplicity's accomplished. Yeah, they, it's more of a responsive rotation. Still, the focus is on Airho, and they're keeping Danesky up in the top, not getting that, keeping Airho all the way back. They're doing some tower damage, and that is evening out uh, things from what Simplicity have done at the bottom. The question is whether or not they're able to translate that later on into being able to get a Dragonite or being able to get something done later on. Because what we've seen from a lot of these teams is have that top lane focus, but the team that has the focus on the bottom lane right from the beginning and brings down that fort first often ends up being able to take the game just because it's that bottom lane is where you have so much mercenary camp pressure. Bot lane controls the real deal. Tychus has peeled off, leaving King Caffeine the availability to go up top, see if he can capture that. But we see Team 12. This is where they can kind of create opportunities for themselves, getting a camp. Finally, they missed out on it the first go round. They get it this time. Urho, let's sneak out. He is eating so much damage. Yeah, it feels like Simplicity has been hesitating to allow Urho to be up in the top ever since they started to see that Dansky was there. And because of that, they're losing out on the focus for them, which has been that bottom lane. Now Team 12 gets their Giants. They start to take over that Shrine. They've left Greymane in the mid to try to make sure that Team 12 don't sneak a Dragonite. And it's been able to nullify a lot of what Simplicity has done so far in this early game. Got Greymane going in middle. Dansky and team are here as well. Zuno's got to be careful. There, that's a nice little dodge. I wonder if we're seeing the transition of ETC to the top and then Dahaka. No, ETC is going to start to head down. I wonder if that meant we were for sure getting a stage dive. Cap's going to get in and put some damage down on Justin as Dainsky comes back in. We'll see if Justin can keep Cap here long enough for Dainsky to start ripping through that health bar with the bigger they are. The grenade comes out. Blessed Shield, too, as they hit 10. First blood right at 10. That's what happens when you slide to the aggressive side. He went the extra damage after the slide on his W. 
That's nice, but when you're by yourself, you kind of wonder, is it worth it? Oh. Nice dodge, or block. Uh, the block. Great block. <laughs> Look, I don't have anything that can reach there except for this cursed bullet. Let me go ahead and, oh, man. Uh, it's a really heads up play there. Good job by Justin. That gives Team 12 the guaranteed Dragon Knight as it starts to work on this middle lane. And Team 12 keeping up the aggression in the bottom lane to get the towers down in multiple lanes. See where they want the first fort takedown to be if they can get these towers down. Stage is going to come in behind Team 12, though. And a little bit of natural agility is going to take him right over the wall. No big deal there. Rip Tire not able to find a target. Just going to find his way over to the DK. Put a little bit of damage into that. Push back the attack. Team 12 gets a little bit of structure value. Urho right now, though, Gilly. Does he use Burrow yet? Uses Drag. Pulls in Goku. He's slow. The Dragon's arrow. Uses the burrow to dodge the drain hope. He's still living for now, but finally they bring him down just as Zuna was hoping to come to the aid of Airho. That condemn clicked it, clipped him right at the edge. It was kind of like that max range. It's like, look, I don't really want to dive under here, but I'll go far enough to where I can just kind of get you at the end of the condemn. So good setup, Justin. Making some really good plays so far using that Bless Shield on Johanna to help confirm some of these kills and giving themselves a full level lead. Structure advantage, nothing wide open yet, but these small moments will add up for Team 12, and this is what they're known to do. Just take a little bit at a time until you just find yourself a level or two down, and they just take control and basically find different ways to end the game off talent to your advantage. And Team 12 get their uh, bruisers. Now they're heading down to the Giants. They're getting them ahead of Simplicity, so there's a couple different options. You can head over and try to see if you can steal with that 13 advantage, the Giants of Simplicity, or just go straight down, knowing that you have the timing advantage to be able to pick up these bruisers quickly. And with having Cure and that serrated arrow, the full scatter shot arrow build, then uh, they get a lot of push yet again down in this bottom lane. We'll see if they can continue to open up this lane, maybe start to get some damage onto the fort, but at least take out the well. I wouldn't be surprised if they might try and make a play here. They have the global advantage. They're down the talent tier, but with Leo up at the top and Johanna middle, Johanna would be slow to rotate. I don't think they can really commit anything until they clear these camps. Johanna now has come down to kind of play that safety anchor role. Looks like Simplicity content with just clearing. They're being so what aggressive, they just can't find a, an opportunity. Wanted to get 13. Airho has been dealing with the Bruiser camp and Goku in the top, which is the end of that fort. This gives a lot more presence on the map to Team 12, not only in that top lane, not only when they get Bruisers and can push that lane all the way to the towers, hold on to that shrine, but just allowing Leo to be more open with his rotations, try to follow up Blessed Shields, things like that with an Entomb. He'll come in, but he's not even needed to give them an ETC kill, or third kill of the game. Justin finding ways to make play. There's the oh, Entomb. there's the Entomb locked in on the wall. Urho is so low, but enough in return to keep him alive. And that is two heroics used defensively on with Stukov and Junkrat. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate they had to use so much there, but they did keep everyone else alive. It's just ETC left, and he has stage dive, so he could get right back in. But for simplicity, the issue is that Team 12 is rapidly approaching level 16 and having a big talent tier advantage. They already have control of both of the shrines. This would be the time to fight, and Kira is picking up the Dragon Knight. A grenade stops it. Hosty wants to go in again. Stage dive is going to be used. Stage dive right on top of Lucio. Pushes him straight into the silence. Goodbye, Lucio. But K Gray Main also falls. K1 Pro setting that up, getting him rooted in there. Just making him a stationary target. Very well done. King Caffeine has a two man power slide. Not enough follow up. Hosty's health bar a little bit too low to commit to that. But Dahaka's coming out on the backside, Gilly. Arrow comes in. And one in the Dragonite. It is Leoric. Arrow's going to get kicked back, so we can't pull anyone into the team and give an extra kill to Simplicity, let them catch up to 16. Simplicity had that kill. The problem was that at the exact same time that Lucio went down, Greymane also fell, giving Team 12 even more experience and leaving it at a four versus four. And then holding on to both of the shrines while that fight started, they were able to pick up the Dragonite without too much more of an issue. So we're slowly seeing Team 12 start to gain control. They had a one level lead. At the end of this, it's going to be two, depending on if they get a pick or not. Could be much worse. Hosty eating a lot of damage there from, from Hanzo as the arrow goes out. Does get dodged. The King Caffeine and K1 Pro trying to get out of here. Zuna's flanking from the side. That's I don't super know if that's aggressive. where you want to be. It's chased back by Kira. 
It's going to be another fort going down. Let's see the Hawk on the minimap. Zuna is in a rather precarious spot here. They really want to engage if they can, but they're pretty far away from 16. It's not like they're right on the edge of it. They're going for Urho. All right, Urho's heading up straight to uh, get into a better place to back. Do I get the blind? Ooh, oh, we got it! Man, just in time. Team 12 sniff out Erho, knowing where he would be to back. And Dahaka goes down at the worst time, and Entomb catches King Caffeine too. He has to stage dive out, and he makes it. It's simplicity just when they maybe would have liked to be setting up for a fight, lose their Dahaka. That's unfortunate, and it kind of is what we saw a little bit against Gale Force was maybe stay in that half second too long. I mean, Justin knew that there were very few places he would be in, gets the dismount or gets the interrupt on the hearth right as he goes. I mean, overextension by a half a second is all it took there for Team 12 to capitalize. Yeah, it's kind of been the story of the game for Simplicity, just when it's been uh, an opportune place for them to do something, they lose someone. They got the Lucio kill, but lost Screaming. Then they lost to Haka. Now they're two levels down versus Team 12. It's only been five kills to one, but the structural advantage has been so severe. Team 12 really making use of having that top fort go down so fast, and then getting that Dragonite, getting the two forts. Let's see if Simplicity can do something to get back in this game before Team 12 hit their Storm Talents at 20. The thing I love most about what Team 12 is doing is they grab the camp at the top that keeps that top lane pushed out and it keeps the Haka locked down. They had a five man defense or, uh, you know, making sure there were five people around that bottom night camp, making sure that if there was an invade, and speaking of an invade, the Haka's under trouble again. Airho trying to head out, the Blessed Shield's there, Dragon Arrow to follow, boot back from Buds, he uses Tunneling Claws, he's gonna come out of that pretty soon. Just hoping he could drag someone back into the towers. Airho survives. Team 12 does use a couple of heroic abilities, hoping for that kill, but even still with that, they have pushed back to Haka so far that they can get into position immediately for the Shrines. What is Simplicity gonna do? They're gonna have to force a fight, and it's probably gonna be around this DK capture. They're in position, they have vision, they have the grenades, but for Team 12, they just simply let the lanes push out, get 20, and they don't have to do this aggressively. This is something where, you know, we saw some teams previously, they get a little bit antsy, they mm. feel like they need to make a play, but Team 12, experienced enough, they'll force the, They'll force the defense. Actually, they, I, I don't understand how Simplicity can just freely give that up. It felt like they were so concerned with making sure that they had the soak and push to 20, or maybe they were just trying to push out in time, and there was some miscommunication about what was happening. But yeah, this is uh, dire straits now for Simplicity. Team 12 gets just a little bit here. They're going to get 20, and you give them an inch, they are like to take a mile here. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you can expect this entire wall to go down. Once both towers are down, that should be enough for 20 with this minion wave here. Look for Team 12 to aggress forward, easily get the keep. But if they get a pick, Leoric, we see him hiding in the bush right now. Although, wait a minute, sound barrier in return. But Goku can easily make this play. Urho trying to flank. Simplicity getting desperate here. They're getting desperate, but it's just a little bit until 20 for Team 12. They know they're running out of time. Goku doing a great job of anchoring that bush, watching for the Dahaka to try to come in, catch someone with a drag. Someone like here, like Buds. There goes the Dragon's Arrow following up after the Entomb. And with the 20 Entomb, the silence there. There's no getting out once you're stuck in that. I'm a bit surprised the way that Team 12 approached that, only getting a keep wall as you had 20, or approaching 20, and that much time left on the DK. The, the play by K1 Pro to get that root into place really allowed them to get in there, but now they're going to use the Odin to get the keep anyways, but get it the old-fashioned way. Another root again, off of the silence. But there is just no way to step forward. It's far too perilous now that that keep goes down and Simplicity are still that far from 20. Talk will be back in nine seconds. Simplicity will have to deal with the catapult pressure, but at this point, just trying to get to 20, trying to stay alive, make sure they don't get picked. No more staggered deaths. That's, that's the thing is that Simplicity always finds this approach to 
Look, we're down, but we're one team fight away from getting back in. They have not been able to find a team fight they really at haven't. all. Like, they looked for early invades, and Team 12 was saying, look, we're here for the long game. Doing exactly the strategy that you would expect from this composition when we talked about it in the draft. And now, simplicity, they can get 20 before the next shrine phase, take a fight. It's going to take multiple team fights beyond this point to end the game if they're on that side. But still, they're in the game. Goku catches with the silencing in tune. Dragon's there to follow, but Zuna stays alive. The great heal from K1 Pro and the silence behind. The cursed bullet goes out. Drag catches Dainsky. They're going for it. They're hoping for it. They take out Dainsky, but they also lose Greymane. Stage dive in. Goku may be the next target, but no. They seem to have found Buds. He's going to swiftly exit the scene. The little boot back is all it took to keep Buds alive. You know, they didn't want to focus Leoric. They thought Leoric might go down in the middle of that. King Caffeine turned his attention over towards Lucio, tried to get more out of it than I think he anticipated not getting. And that actually, I think, hurt him just a little bit. I know Leoric gets back on the battlefield a little bit sooner, but every little bit counts. However, Simplicity got 20 in the middle of that, Gilly. Yeah, they did. They finally have 20. It took quite a while. Question as to what um, both Stukov and Dahaga. Dahaga gets Contagion. Still considering on Stukov, in general, you don't see any fluctuation from the controlled chaos, but we'll see what K1 Pro wants to play here. Johanna making use of all of her abilities, including the Bless Shield to make sure and survive. But with this pushed bottom, and Johanna is, is staying top. Strictly because multiple people will have to respond to that knight and siege camp. Johanna remaining top can help initiate and get out of here. Arrow. Arrow, that's that's a more than, oh, he's. Play of the game. Kieran Goku show up and caps in a dangerous spot. He's going to try to stage dive out <laughs> and just barely does. What a close call. And he does it going all the way to the bottom shrine. Yep. And that buys enough time. I mean, it's a long cooldown, but it keeps this game alive for simplicity. They are hanging in there, and they have done a lot to clear out the bottom. This would help so much if they could get this giant camp too. He's gonna go forward and at least keep them uh, dismounted, slow them down where he can, but not confident enough to move all the way on forward and try to steal that camp. The so Haka's coming up on the backside, Gilly. Coming up on the backside, Airho catches Kira. Tunneling Claws in, they've got the Riptire following up. They look like they're kind of focusing on a lot of different people, but they turn it on to Goku and force out a sound barrier. They couldn't find the single target focus the minute Hanzo got out of there. They were fine. Good sound barrier from Buds to make sure and keep everybody alive. Tahaka has moved to the top, but we've got a buried alive moment here. Tomb that the Flailing Swipe helps, so does the Mind to get Hosty out. Now K1 Pro in danger, another Flailing Swipe, but it's just not enough. Stukov goes down. Zuna's gonna dodge and hosty the arrow, but it does let Kira get back into the battle, hoping that they can get another kill. They've only got the kill on Stukov, but it may just be enough as Team 12 march forward, pushing them back with the Odin. They recognize that should be enough. Dainsky just barely surviving there. Stage type to the backside, it's not in range. And like you said, that one kill might be enough here. This DK, we're looking 19, 20 minutes in. Can they get the core? They might. I was gonna say they might turn their attention to mid keep, but I think right now you've at least got to test the waters. No Odin, however, though, Gilly. No, the Odin was used really well by Dansky just to force back simplicity enough that Team 12 with Johanna got that uh, shrine and then went and got the Dragon Knight before simplicity could recognize. And now Team 12 are trying to go for the end of the game, hoping for the core. 10 seconds until they have Stukov back to help with the supporting of this, as the Dragon Knight has been nearly brought down. The Riptire is going to go out just as the Sound Barrier does, too. The Dragon Knight is down, but we're down to 60%. This is going to be Team 12 getting onto the core, 30% and falling. It looks like they do have enough here, Gilly, as that should be game. Team 12 taking complete control. Once they got past that middle or that early scary phase of all the invades, Simplicity not able to get anything out of them. They did well to control the camps. They got the Siege Giant. They invaded down at the bottom night camp. They came back again. And they weren't able to get anything out of that. And the safe rotations of Team 12 with those early game compositions, I think they learned from their mistakes with Tempo Storm in this similar style composition, their rotations. 
took that, used the camps to their advantage to control after that second spawn of the camps. And from then on out, it feels like they had control of that game, just getting one or two picks. Yeah, it felt really telling that Simplicity hadn't gotten a kill even with that more aggressive composition. By the time we got to heroic abilities, there was still no kill on the battlefield. And with a safe composition for Team 12, it feels way more like Team 12 is doing what works for their composition and making sure that Simplicity doesn't get the most out of theirs. But I would also say that moving Dainsky to the top and helping with uh, Goku there too was enough of a scare to force back and stop Simplicity from doing what they wanted to do. All of a sudden, oh, there's two people in the top lane. We can't just let Goku and Dainsky do this, but that sends ETC up to the top. Oh. ETC is a big part of the initiation factor, the power slide to hold them down on the lurking arm. And suddenly they don't have the scare, the threat of those kills anymore. And that is the exact same moment when Team 12 started being the ones to take over that bottom camp and everything else in the bottom lane. That was probably the most surprising part for me was the fact that they sent ETC up there and the fact yeah. that they didn't got virtually nothing out of it. I mean, they got a little bit of control on the shrine, but when you're losing out on the rest of the battleground in the process, is that worth it? I mean, you've got the, okay, which one will I eventually get more value out of? It seems like you get instant value if you get a pick, but if you don't get that pick, you're punished that much harder on the other side. So the balance there for simplicity, it seemed like a little bit of a miscall in just that little window allowed the Team 12 to get that. We saw them get the first DK, one level lead, get another DK, two level lead, and from then on out, it was just game over. Yeah, I almost wonder what it would have been like if we had just seen them say, Simplicity say, we're, we're gonna lose this top four. It is what tends to happen when you see that imbalance of focusing on the top, but we'll trade, we'll race, we'll push down in the bottom instead. And this allows us to keep control of the camps and make sure that we are keeping ourselves in the game somehow. And maybe even using that to Haka, if he was able to push back, clear out the bruisers eventually, uh, cause that power play of having the 5v4 in the bottom lane while Leoric's trying to get down. But, either way, great rotations from Team 12 earned them the victory in Game 1. Pretty soon we'll be going into Game 2. But uh, Simplicity not winning on their battleground has to hurt a little bit. It hurts a little bit, but I wouldn't be too upset about it. You know, we might see Tomb of the Spider Queen, depending on if Team 12 gets the map pick. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that Simplicity can take away from that is that Team 12 did everything in their power not to take a team fight. Right. And Dragonshire, it's a lot easier to do that. And we saw Simplicity, they were very aggressive with their rotations in the first few minutes. There's some other battlegrounds. If we do go to Tomb of the Spider Queen, it's there. Battlefield of Eternity was mm -hmm. not banned out this time around. So Team 12 is very capable of taking a team fight. Don't get me wrong. It's just simplicity. You know, you look at the history of all those names. That's what they're known for. So there is a lot of possibilities that simplicity, despite not winning on their battleground, lesson learned. Well, let's see where we're going for game two. So